welcome uh, to AppNexus, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we've got a terrific group of people here tonight. Um, a few thank yous just to start us off. Thank you first to uh, Brian, to Michael, to Ewan, and the team at AppNexus for uh, giving us use of this fantastic space and for really serving as a hub for people and ideas in the New York tech community. Um, and thank you also to Silicon Valley Bank, who uh, generously sponsored this event and for all the great work they do in the, uh, in the New York tech community. Um, my name is Nick Baim. I'm a partner at Venrock, the venture capital firm, and have been a longtime investor in the New York startup ecosystem. And we are very lucky tonight to have three of the most successful uh, serial entrepreneurs in the history of the New York ecosystem. I would argue potentially the three best. Um, Kevin Ryan, Fabrice Grinda, and Brian O'Kelly. And just to give you a ballpark sense of the magnitude of their achievements, uh, amongst these three, and I did the math last night, tell me if it's wrong, they have started 14 companies, and if you add up the value of those companies, historical exit values and current values, they're worth $6.3 billion. Uh, they employ 3,000 people plus currently, and the biggest ones, uh, AppNexus, Gilt, MongoDB, are still growing rapidly, so I think those numbers will increase substantially. So thank you guys very much for joining us. It's really a fantastic week. So the reason we brought them together, the purpose of the discussion this evening is to try to understand the key wisdom that they've learned in building multiple successful companies um, that can be helpful to entrepreneurs who have come tonight. Uh, there's a lot of advice in the public domain, in the blogosphere, for entrepreneurs on how to build companies. Um, some of it's good, some of it's not so good, some of it comes from credible sources, some of it less so. And I find that the best advice of that sort tends to come from people who have been there and done that, people who have built successful companies. And, and of that group, the most insightful and I think thoughtful advice of all comes from people who have done it multiple times, who have built multiple successful companies. They've made mistakes along the way. They tend to get better and better as they go along. The values of the companies tend to get bigger and bigger. Hence the panel tonight. So let me give a brief introduction to the panelists and, um, and then we'll jump in when we're done. We've got uh, drinks and um, sort of appetizers outside. Um, so first, Brian O'Kelly. Brian runs this place, uh, founder and CEO of AppNexus. Brian was previously the visionary and CTO at Right Media, which built the first successful online ad exchange. Right Media, as I think many of you know, was acquired by Yahoo. It was a big event in the New York ecosystem, bought for about $850 million. And Brian built on that vision very substantially in um, founding AppNexus. And uh, we are very excited to be investors in AppNexus. And it's been fun watching it slowly engulf the display advertising ecosystem online. Uh, Fabrice Grinda uh, was the founder, co-founder, and CEO or co-CEO of three successful companies. Um, Auckland SA, which was an early online um, uh, marketplace, auction marketplace in Europe. Uh, Zingy, which was a New York-based uh, 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 wireless media company. And then most recently, OLX, which is one of the largest online classified sites in the world. On the side, when he's not founding companies, uh, Fabrice is an angel investor. He has made 128, last I counted, it may have gone up uh, in the last day, 128 successful uh, angel, well, hopefully successful, 128 angel investments in 10 different countries. Um, and then finally, Kevin Ryan. Kevin is the uh, co-founder and chairman of Gilt, MongoDB, Business Insider, Zola, three other companies. He's on the board of Human Rights Watch, Yale, a bunch of other things. Uh, and my personal opinion, I think if New York is going to elect another entrepreneur as mayor, it should be Kevin. Um, so anyway, so that's the panel for tonight. So we're gonna chat for about 45 minutes. This is gonna be a very laid back and conversational format. So everybody feel free to jump in at any time. I thought it'd be best to start out with something that everybody can sympathize with which is the biggest mistake you made in your first company. And Kevin, I figured yours was gonna be particularly funny, so if, I, I don't know if you wanna kick us off. There's so many of them is the, uh, is the challenge. Um, I think over time, it wasn't so much in the very beginning, but uh, I would say that the majority of the acquisitions we did uh, didn't work, and we spent too much money. And so uh, you know, capital is too free, and that can happen when there's a lot of capital out there. And so the combination created too much dilution, too much cost, uh, and then results in pain when things start to go down because if you have 2,000 people and we got rid of 1,000, um, you, you regret some of those moves that you made along the way. So I think it was too much exuberance. Um, it's hard finding that right balance though between you want to move very quickly to be the leader and then you overshoot the mark and you have to pull back and that, that happens. 
I mean, I've made two fundamental mistakes. The first one, just in, my first company was in France. Uh, <laughs> something tells you you're not going to make that mistake, so I'll, I'll go briefly on that one. But basically, you can't fire people. The government is proactively against you. Like they, pa they gave a monopoly in auctions to government auctioneers. I had to sue them. Then, by sheer, you know, Coincidence, of course, I was audited by the French IRS like three days later. The, <laughs> you can't fire people regardless of how bad they are if they show up at the office drunk. Uh, they try to send me to jail for not doing my military service. I mean, long less, so don't do business in France. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 um, maybe the, 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 the more relevant lesson for you guys um, is as I was selecting my investors, uh, someone came in with a term sheet twice the valuation, four times the investment than all of the other investors. And it was from a name investor in France. And so I felt compelled to do it, despite the fact that I actually had hated the entire interaction with this team. I had hated my interactions with him. I thought they didn't understand anything about what they were doing. But it was so much money in such a prestigious name, I took the money. And it didn't seem to be a mistake for a long time until the exit came in or until the tougher times came where we realized our interests are not all aligned uh, and they weren't there to back me when things went badly. And so selecting VC, it's a venture capitalist, is like, getting married, and you want to select someone who's going to be, who understands you, you get along with, and who's going to stand by you when things go bad. And that means, you know, not optimizing on price, because what you care most about is not the price or the valuation in which people come in, but your exit, and making sure that you get to an exit. Hmm. You made any mistakes, Brian? I've just made so many. Um, I, I'm not even sure which one was the first startup, but I think that, um, you know, if you go back to the sort of early days of Right Media, I mean, Right Media led a charmed existence. Like, we, we were extremely fortunate and had a lot of successes along the way. Um, we made our first big mistakes as we started to get traction in the market. So, um, we sort of had this fortunate invention of the ad exchange, which wasn't really the ad exchange, it was this idea of linking liquidity pools across different ad networks. It didn't, you know, it's not very sexy to say I invented ad network linking. Um, inventing an ad exchange sounds much cooler. Um, but we really did do something that had never been done before. Actually, Dwight Merriman about this time told us it was impossible, um, which was a very inspiring thing to be told that what we had done was impossible, although at times a little depressing because Dwight was the, you know, sort of the godfather of ad tech and, you know, it was like, okay, Either he's wrong or he's right, and either way, <laughs> we're gonna do it. Um, but the problem was that because no one had ever done it before, there was no roadmap, there was no template for success. And so we, you know, we, we got a couple customers and we built the organization, but we didn't really build the organization. We were a scrappy group of ninjas doing something sort of unknown. And so the second it got successful, it turned out there was a network effect behind the business. Every ad network in the world called us and said, we want to use the right media platform because every node we added to the network would print money. It was, a, it was a perpetual motion machine. The more liquidity in the marketplace, the more money everyone made. And so everyone called their friends and said, join. But right media didn't have the um, customer services people, the account management people, the legal department, the HR department. We had nothing except for a bunch of sort of ninjas. And so running a business that grew, I think, 35x in a year um, really required us to work 24 hours a day. And at one point, we finally had to stop taking new business. You know, we, we had no salespeople. People would call me personally and say, Brian, I want a contract. Um, and so I think the biggest mistake actually was not realizing how successful we were about to be and not laying the framework, the, the, the groundwork for being a successful software company. Um, we sold to Yahoo, I think I had 19 <coughs> direct reports. We never introduced any kind of middle management layer. Um, we never created any kind of business scale. Um, we never successfully developed a human resources department. I mean, nothing that looked like a successful company. And so, you know, the lesson I learned from Right Media was you have to build a successful business and a successful company, and those are not necessarily tied. Uh, and a lot of what you see as you walk around AppNexus is the results of that rather painful lesson. Um, and I feel a lot of times like we got lucky when Yahoo bought the company because you know, the next step would have been very difficult without that core actual company layer um, that would let us sustain and grow the business over time. So outside of addressing those particular mistakes and keeping the focus kind of early in your evolution of learning, what were some of the other lessons that came out of your initial company experiences that, that really stuck, stuck out as important? You know, I think a lot of them sound very generic, but 
I think most of us look back and when you have something that went well or something that didn't go well, you generally conclude that you hired well or you didn't hire well. It wasn't so much a strategy issue or things like that. So, you know, if it, it's like a basketball team. If you have the best people, it, it, it will work and they will make it work. Um, but that's incredibly hard. I mean, we've all made, you know, as a group, I'm sure many great hiring decisions and then a bunch that really did not work. Um, and you have to cut your losses and, and move on. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to find that fit, and it's hard to find great people. And, and what lessons on, on hiring have you learned that might be helpful to those here? I just had one thing that I, I mentioned before that over time I've come to rely less on the interview process and more on the reference process. So I think at an extreme, as I always say, if, you, if I said to you, uh, you need to hire a, a CFO, you can't interview anyone. Well, in addition to thinking I'm crazy, what would you do? You all of a sudden would say, oh my God, I'm gonna have to do like 20 reference checks because I've never met this person. I need to know how they are professionally, how they are personally, what are they like, I mean, I have to do everything. And that would probably be a better process because you can't help it. Everyone is thrown off by, you meet the person, you know, he seems you know, well-spoken and handsome and uh, good and presents well and answers questions well and you're thrown off by that and that really has very little to do with the core skills you're looking for, which are, you know, can you integrate with other people? Does he really get stuff done? Attention to detail, all those things, you can't interview for that. So references, references, references. I know people who have interviewed 25 candidates, you know, essentially spent 25 hours in that process. And then I asked him, so how much time did you spend on the reference checking? Like, oh yeah, I mean, definitely. I, 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 I called one or two people. And there are people that they were given, and so that's, that's not the right, Ratio. Would you say when you've made mistakes in hiring, it's almost inevitably been for lack of uh, yeah. comprehensive reference? And even, and uh, I mean, I can think of an example that Nick and I were involved with of hiring someone who had a fantastic resume. You think this is the best person you could get, and then uh, a year later it didn't work out. And then what really annoyed me is six months after that, I ran into someone who said, "Oh, you hired so and so? Really? Well, you know, he's this, 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 and this." And three of them were negative. And I was like, oh my God, you know, this person knew exactly what was going to happen. Described the person perfectly. I didn't get to the right person. And it had I, it, we would have made a different decision. Yeah, it's hard about that, I think, in my experiences, you know, having never been a CEO before and certainly not at a company of the scale of an AppNexus, um, you know, I've never known at certain phases, like, how, what, what a job should look like. So I didn't know the right questions to ask. So, you know, for the entrepreneurs in the group, I mean, how many of you have actually hired a public company CFO with the intent of going public? You know, I mean, it's something that once you've done it, you probably know how to do it again. But um, for me, every single role we filled past about 100 people, I've never done before. I've never managed a CFO before. I've never managed a general counsel before. I've never managed a world-class, you know, human resources people type person. And so hiring those people is actually very difficult if you don't even know what you need them to do. Um, and I think that's actually been my challenge is once I hire the wrong person and do it wrong for a while, it's pretty easy to hire the right person. But even those reference checks, you know, if I don't know what I need, uh, and I'm maybe just as a, yeah. you know, an entrepreneur, I'm very hands-on, like do it myself and see what works. It's a different experience perhaps than, you know, I could certainly give you a lot of good advice but it, it really doesn't matter too because companies change so often. Like what we needed at 50 is very different than what we need today at 550. And, but if you say, do you have the right team for being a 2,000 person company? I have absolutely no idea. I sure hope so. Um, but you know, we can go have a drink and you can tell me yes or no. But I, I think that's the really hard part for me as an entrepreneur is everything's always different at every phase. Even as a repeat entrepreneur, I, I would hate to imagine you know, doing this again at this scale the first time around. I think that the lesson, I mean, maybe changing topic a little bit away from hiring, even though I think hiring is fundamentally important. And I guess maybe the mistake I've made historically has been doing the reference checks and not thinking about culture and like hiring super experienced people who had the best references in the world, but maybe they didn't, weren't suited for a fast moving environment. Um, I think the second, for me, biggest lesson I've learned, you know, when it's not related to uh, the investors you select or um, how to hire people. So probably you really need, if, if you're creating a startup, you need to ask for, for, for forgiveness and never ask for permission. 
And the entire success of most of my startups have been basically breaking the, the, the existing rules. I mean, my second company was a big mobile content company in, trying to, in, 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 an, era, in an era where text messages, you can even send a text message within the same carrier from one cell phone to the other unless they had cell phone plans. And so needed to basically knock on the door of carriers to ask for permission would have never worked. They basically didn't care, et cetera. So we literally hacked into their system to allow delivery of messages between and, and, and of, of mobile games and, um, and, and of, and of uh, ringtones. And the music companies didn't want to give us licenses. So we literally violated every copyright law you can ever imagine. But we actually, but we, and, and it's a $150,000 or $250,000 uh, penalty per infringement. But because the, money, the company never had any money, um, they could always try, threaten to sue me. And when they would call me, I'd say, oh, this is so fantastic of you to reach out to me. I've been trying to, work, to talk to you guys forever and be so positive and happy that these lawyers are sending me these cease and desist letters for billions of, literally tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. But when the company had 10,000 in the bank, there's nothing they can do. Uh, it's more expensive for them to sue me and close the company down than to do a deal with me. And by being so friendly, and actually I, I documented all the downloads we had had. And um, in fact, some cases I'd send money uh, the money that I thought would have been due if we had contracts, and they had actually cashed them, so we had like implicit contracts. And so two years in, I mean, it literally took two years of like knocking on the doors and begging and groveling uh, of, and breaking, frankly, every rule in the book. Eventually, we were the only ones who ended up having the contracts because we would settle for five to $10,000 all these, uh, you know, cease and desist letters that weren't exactly lawsuits. And when, when the carriers finally changed their mind, we were there and we were ready. I mean, in the meantime, of course, missed payroll 27 times. Um, I, I, I missed rent payment for five months. We went from like 27 people to seven people. I mean, I was living on ramen noodles for almost a year. You know, my daily cost structure was about $2 because all I could afford was like the noodles. And I lived in the office uh, and slept on the couch uh, or on, on mattresses. So it, 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 it took you know, grit and tenacity. But frankly, don't ask for permission. Just do it and you can figure it out later. So for peace, I'm, I'm sensing a general pattern here of being chased down by major authorities, major companies, <laughs> after breaking most national laws and company policies, and it's, it's worked out well. I mean, think of Uber, right? Think of Airbnb. Yeah. If Uber and Airbnb had, had asked uh, taxi authorities or cities whether they, can, um, uh, whether, they can ha whether they could actually operate, they would have said, absolutely no, you're violating the hotel licenses, you're violating the taxi monopolies, and they wouldn't be the multi-billion dollar companies that we have today. And the thing is, you have to think that if whatever you're doing is going in the direction of history, ultimate, and consumers want it, ultimately it will happen. And so as long as you're providing a service that people value, um, there might be stupid laws passed along the way. Like in France, they said that you can, Uber was not allowed, even the car arrived within less than 15 minutes, you were not allowed to get in for 15 minutes. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of stupid laws like that that have been passed around the world. But in the long run, and might be a few years, you know, and they go, these products and services make people's lives better and they will be legal and accepted. And, and that rule applies in France, that eventually things do go right? They did, they, it takes longer in France, but <laughs> yeah. believe it or not, they actually overturned the law a few months later. So even though it was hectic for a few months. So when you think about what's changed in how you spend your time from your, when you were sort of driving your first company to today, um, the things you focused on, culture, team, hiring, how much you delegated, what's changed in how you spend your time? Uh, what's changed? Well, uh, look, in the pattern of my companies that have started very small and then gotten bigger, uh, in the beginning, you're really doing two things. You're, you're really creating the product and you're hiring people. And then as you get bigger, you're going to spend less time on product just because you have a lot of people doing it. Um, and, and the reality is you're going to spend more time on administration stuff. You know, if you want to be CEO, there's just going to be committees and budgets and managing and then a lot more public elements. So, you know, we have, a, if you, we have 1,500 people and you've got yeah, offices in 15 different offices. You know, you are spending a, a fair amount of time going there as a presence, being there, being large speeches. Uh, so that's just a different type of job. And some people like that part and some people don't. Some people want to get back into a smaller company or do things like that. But I think that's the general change. But Brian, you've seen it in the last couple of years going. Yeah, I guess I've resisted that part of the job as much as possible. Um, and there's days I think, gosh, it'd be great to have someone do all that for me. But I think one thing that's great about AppNexus is that we have a very strong 
sort of senior management team that does a lot of the administration. So we've just hired incredibly strong senior executives who, you know, can step in and manage, um, you know, finance, people, operations. You know, I, I probably underinvest in some of the overseas travel, but you know, Michael Rubenstein, who's our president, is off to Singapore next week for you know an Asia tour. Um, I'll go to Europe. You know, we, we can divide up a lot. And I think that's something that's been really great is, you know, I do spend a lot of time embedded in the product where I think I have, you know, historical and current value. Um, I, I try to keep the figurehead and public speaking to a minimum. One reason that I'm afraid of being public too soon is that there's a huge amount of effort, I think, required to go tell a story um, and, and speak to a different constituency that we haven't really built all the company maturity for. So if you look at where I spend my time, I suspect that ratio hasn't changed as much in the past couple of years. I'd say the difference between the founding time, like on my couch in my one bedroom apartment until maybe 100, 150 people was probably the biggest transition. And I've been able to keep, say, 50-50 sort of doing things and running things um, since then. And we'll see how that changes. Again, the next phase is the one where that pressure will increase, I think. And one thing I'd add is that you, um, there's, there's no right answer to this at all. So, Different CEOs have dramatically different time allocations than other CEOs, and it can work fine. When at DoubleClick, for example, when Kevin O'Connor was the CEO and I was the president, um, most of, no one realized on the outside, and we never even told outside investors that everyone in the company reported to me, and actually no one really reported to Kevin. Uh, Kevin wanted to. Kevin didn't like to manage people, first of all, and he spent his time really on product, which he was very good at and very external things, um, which was fantastic. And so it just works. So you start when you're CEO just saying, what do I want to work on? And basically, unless I have to, let's have other people do everything else. And that's a perfectly good way to do it. And that can allocate, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg spends his time very differently than most CEOs. Not better or worse, it's working for him. Mm. Oculus gaming. <laughs> <laughs> So, so psychological questions, serial entrepreneurs are a very particular breed. You guys had all been very financially successful at, at a young age with your first uh, company successes, but you kept going and going. And Kevin, you've kept going <laughs> longer than almost anyone I know, and the successes have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and you're, you're still thinking up new ideas. So what, what is it that drives you guys to start additional companies? For me, the answer is clear, it's just fun. That uh, yes, this can be, this is a business that can be financially, you know, very rewarding, but it, you should be doing what you like to do. And so if, you know, nothing ever paid any money, I would still be doing this because there's just, I love the challenge of starting from, from scratch. You've got generally either it hasn't been done before or you're going against some entrenched competitors. And so it just becomes sort of a big competition. And so you're doing the best you can and that's really fun and you're building up morale and so I feel like I'm not doing that much different than I did running student council in, in high school. Managing groups, getting people together, doing fun things. It could be athletics, it could be nonprofits, it could be businesses. This just happens to be an extraordinarily fun, intellectually interesting, interesting and lucrative field and there are just so many opportunities. I mean, if I had more time, I'd start more companies. Uh, it just doesn't get more fun than this. I think, I think the answer is the same probably for most entrepreneurs. It's like, we love doing what we do. We love building companies. Like, I mean, taking something, you're creating something out of nothing. You're, you're inspiring people to work for you. You have customers that you please and, and you provide, create products and services that people love. And so there's nothing more rewarding than that. I mean, OLX, we have 150 million uh, visitors a month that are unique. And so every day we get literally like thousands of letters from people telling us how we've changed their lives for the better. And there's nothing that makes you feel better about yourself than like just reading customer love letters. They're like, oh wow, you know, the, the, I, I must be doing something a little bit good in the world. And, and I think that's more rewarding than anything else. The, now I never set out to be a serial entrepreneur. I like building companies. Uh, I, I'd be happy building one just forever. It just so happened that people often, especially people who work for me wanted liquidity or the company fit better in, in, a bit, in another organization and would have had more opportunities to grow, et cetera. And so ultimately I had exits and saw myself as an entrepreneur. So it made sense for me to build again. But it's not as though I set out, ooh, I want to build X companies in my life. It's like, I like building you know, tech products and I, I like running products in most of my companies. And um, once the, a story ended for whatever reason, but typically a good reason, meaning it fit better somewhere else or the team wanted liquidity, et cetera, I went on and built a new thing. 
And uh, I can't imagine doing anything else. It's, it's the funnest thing there is. Maybe you guys aren't actively being CEOs right now, but um, fun is not the word I would choose to describe <laughs> my job. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's actually an interesting question. I mean, I, I, I think I started being an entrepreneur because I kept getting fired from every job I had. <laughs> um, so that's, that's always a, a positive. Um, but I think that, you know, when I started AppNexus, I started AppNexus because I got fired from Right Media. Um, the CEO of Right Media got pissed off at me and fired me. And um, you, you tell me if this is a fair firing. I walked into his office, okay, just, I'm, just, honestly, just neutral jury, and I said, I'm a better CEO than you, I should have your job, you should let me be CEO. <laughs> like, I could do this better than you, you know, and what the hell is this talk of selling to Yahoo, that's crazy, this is a huge market, we could win, you know, don't sell. And so he fired me and sold. Um, and uh, unfair, right? <laughs> like, what nerve? Um, <laughs> And so I started up Nexus to prove to him and everyone else that I could be a better CEO than he was, that, I, that this was a bigger market than he thought, and um, that in the hindsight, you know, he was right, just to be clear. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a, it, it vastly overpaid for a crappy company that was gonna fall apart. And, um, you know, and thank God he fired me because I never had to work for Yahoo. Because they would have fired me in like three days. Um, so actually, it was the best time to be fired. Uh, didn't have to go through any aggression, you know, didn't have to deal with like, just all the bullshit of being acquired. Um, and I, I basically had a free pass, aside from a non-compete, to go, you know, put a big chip on my shoulder and start the company. And in fact, when, when Vinrock invested, it was right after my non-compete expired. And Mike Terrell, I walked into his office after 40 VCs rejected me, and I said, I'm gonna take out Right Media. I'm gonna frickin' destroy them. I'm gonna go after Google. I'm going to take back the idea I invented, like, there's just no way anyone can stop me. He's like, well, what do you got to show for it? I'm like, look, it's only been seven days since the non-compete ended, like, wh what do you mean, what do I got? You know? And, um, you know, after 40 people said, you're crazy, you know, uh, Mike said, you're crazy. Here's some money. Um, <laughs> and uh, here we are. But what's hard for me now is, like, you know, I think the chip on my shoulder has largely disappeared. I mean, I feel like we've, we've proven as a team that you know, we, can, we, we, we destroyed Right Media in January, Marissa Meyer went to CES and formally turned off Right Media, which was both sad for me as it was my baby and sort of happy for me as the you know, six year mission to destroy it was successful. <laughs> um, mixed feelings. Um, we took all their customers, um, everyone. So that was good. Um, so but the problem is there's still Google out there. Um, and um, so, you know, it's like, can I really quit right now when we haven't taken Google out of the knees? Because um, they're running an ad exchange. I still feel like it's mine. So, um, you know, if any of you work at Google, love you. Like seriously, totally great partners. It's been wonderful being a partner of yours. Keep giving us money. Um, and we'll talk in a few years. So I think that maybe it's just arbitrary mountains to climb. Like, it, you know, what's fulfilling about my job is that when I step away and look at what we've built, you know, the technology platform, the scale, the innovation, the team, you know, all of the things we've done, it's incredibly fulfilling. And I feel like there's a chance to make a real impact in the world. Um, if you say, why is advertising meaningful uh, versus, say, you know, human rights. Um, I'll make a strong case to you that you know, by funding content in a way that doesn't require you to write a check, um, you know, we actually are creating a democratized internet where anybody can go to a world-class journalism site, whether that's New York Times or the Huffington Post, and not have to you know, pay money. And that maybe this is an economy we can create that allows entrepreneurs to find customers and do all these things. Like I can tell you that story, but the truth is, you know, I don't know what else to do. You know, like I, this is what I do. Like, this is what fulfills me. This is what I know how to do. This is where I create you know, something of substance. Um, and I'd love to tell my daughter in you know, 20 years, like, I built something. I did something. Um, and and I, I, I can't justify it beyond that. That's a great story. So, so this is the most specific question I'll ask and kind of gets to the meat of, of the subject uh, for tonight, which is if there were three lessons each of you could pass on as the three most in lessons you would impart to, uh, to a new entrepreneur, 
um, based on all your experience, what would those three lessons be? I'm not sure I have things different than the ones we talked about earlier on hiring. I mean, you know, the, the building blocks of a company are the idea, people, and money. And people actually, and slightly the idea, lead to money. The idea is generally overvalued um, because even if you have a good idea, all that means is you're four months ahead of Fabrice, who's going to see your idea, recognize that that is a good idea, and then start a competitor. And so then you're just going to go head to head. And, and I'm using Fabrice as representative of a thousand other people. Um, you know, when we started Gilt, when I had the idea, I thought this is a really good idea. Um, by the time we launched, ideally had launched two months before that. And Hot Look launched a week later, and Rula La launched a month later. So the idea was worth nothing. Then it's just a knock down, drag out fight to see who's going to be biggest. Uh, so it's all execution, which goes back to people. So um, every answer that I always have ends up coming back to, to people, and which leads to execution. Hire really well, choose the right co-founders. I think I'm, I'm a big believer in, in the lead and startup methodology. I mean, today you can build a startup for so extraordinarily cheap. I mean, you want to launch an e-commerce startup, you have Magento or Shopify. I mean, you have all these tools that are free and available. You have all this learning in terms of how you do marketing. I mean, in terms of like customer acquisition costs versus LTV, cord analysis, et cetera. So there's all this knowledge base that makes it really easy to launch companies and like think through what the marketing strategy is. So basically it's like, you can never launch too early. You should be ashamed of the first product you put out there and you iterate, iterate, iterate. So for me, disruptive product change is basically the sum total of 1% improvements done a thousand times over. And if you keep multivariate testing everything, you end up with something that's, you know, that ends up outperforming all of your competitors because you're gonna have competitors. I mean, I just helped build an end-to-end -end car marketplace uh, called BP, and we're actually the innovators here. We're the ones who came up with the idea. We're doing business model innovation, et cetera, and I think in the last month, like 15 competitors launched. Uh, and sometimes like word for word, word for word copy of everything we have on the site. Like the wording, everything is the same. The business model, I mean, to the, to the letter. But at the end of the day, the idea in this case doesn't matter. It's like running like hell to execute and uh, iterating as fast as we can and, and, and getting things done. And, and then at the end of the day, you, you know, we'll see where the ships fall. And so, you know, I'm a huge believer in like throwing it into the wall, see if it sticks and keep iterating, iterating, and keep it super lean. I mean, today, when we built companies like 15 years ago, we needed like Oracle databases and Microsoft web servers. I mean, it costs millions just to operate. We need to operate our own data centers, build computers. Today, you use AWS and everything's variable. And you know, you can, I could launch almost any startup. I mean, maybe not hardcore tech startups, but like for less than 50K. And there's no reason any of you can't be entrepreneurs and like try things. It works, it works, it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. You know, move on to the next. One thing I'd add also is that out of new things I see, um, I'd say half the time my criticism of an idea I see is that it's not really a company. They're, they're designing a product, uh, you know, or sometimes a feature. And it's just, you know, that, that I think is generally a mistake. You're, just, you're, you're better off just waiting and coming up with something you think is bigger. It's actually easier to finance, you know, uh, because people like Nick immediately see that things are not that big. And, and don't want to be involved. Uh, but I see people super passionate about incredibly narrow ideas. Yeah, no, as, an intro, as an investor, I want unit economics. So you come to see me once you're live with 5K a month in revenues. But you need to show to me that your customer acquisition cost is about half of your net contribution margin for the first year for a customer based on like three months of data and fast forward, you know, projected for a year. You show me that, I'm an investor. And, and so to, to, to Kevin's point is like, it's not just building a feature. It's like think through what business you're building and who you're going to charge, how much you're going to charge. Uh, I guess for me what's hard is, you know, I'm coming up for my 15th reunion at Princeton uh, in a few months, and I... You're old. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> the kids I go talk to there, I spoke at an entrepreneurship class, and they're young. Like, there's no question they're young. And I, I, I remember being 21, uh, and starting my first sort of real startup, raised a half million dollars from angels, and I was such an idiot. I mean, I just had no idea what I was getting myself into. I had a business plan, you know. I was able to raise money because it was a hot market. Um, I hired like a quarter of the graduating class from Princeton's computer <laughs> science department. Uh, week after graduation, I had, you know, 30 employees in LA, um, you know, 
living on worse than ramen, I think. Um, but w what's really hard about it is no, no advice you could have given me would have really worked because I was so determined to do it that I would have ignored you. And in fact, I had a bunch of you know, mentors and advisors and all the advice just felt to me like it was sort of abstract, like hire well. I mean, yeah, I hired what do you do with a that? quarter of my class, like all the computer scientists I could hire. I mean, you know, get great investors of the zero that I had on offer, <laughs> you know, focus on execution. Like, what is execution? Like, is there a difference between, so the hard thing is that there's no, there's no real obvious way to explain to someone, like, how hard it is going to be to actually make it work. I mean, what you went through, the tenacity, like, tenacity is a massive understatement to describe what you did. Um, and I think most people who I really respect and know in the entrepreneurship community, like, if you, we had Ben Horowitz here a couple weeks ago, like, after listening to Ben Horowitz talk about his experience at Loud Cloud and Opsware, if you don't want to vomit, you've never <laughs> been an entrepreneur. And you want to vomit because it's so true. You know, even if you looked at my day to day, the number of things I've gone and done, like, I mean, my daughter thinks I sit in meetings all day, and she's right. Like, I sit in meetings from the moment I get to work until the moment I get to do something like come on stage. Um, every moment I'm here, I'm on stage. Every time I walk through the office, every employee is looking at me, watching my emotions, looking at, you know, where I'm spending time. They know if I'm in a closed door meeting, an open door meeting. Like, this is such an incredibly intense experience. So I guess my advice out of all of that would be that, you know, this is the most intense thing I can imagine. You know, there are people who argue that, you know, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs are the new, you know, if every era of, of time there's some job that truly represents that time. And I guess I would argue that entrepreneurship is really the summation of everything that it sits in the middle of our society. And if you want to be an entrepreneurial leader and you really want to go through this process, Godspeed, you know, but you better be ready for it. Um, and answer the question every morning when you wake up is, am I gonna walk into the office with every single ounce of what I have? And if you can't say yes to that question and, and see yourself in five years doing the same thing, which is impossible, by the way, to know what you're gonna be like in five years, um, you'll realize that every aspect of this is impossible. So if that doesn't scare you, um, if you're like me 10 years ago, completely going to ignore anything anyone says, <laughs> this is the job for you. If you don't wanna get paid well, fail often, you know, and publicly, can't, can't recommend anything else. But that's not very good advice. <laughs> It's like vitamins. Apparently, if you take vitamins, they don't do anything. But people who take vitamins are much healthier than those who don't. So my best advice is, if you're the kind of person who takes advice, you probably shouldn't take this advice. <laughs> but be the kind of person who doesn't take the advice I'm giving. <clears throat> I don't know. Did that make any sense? It totally made sense. It totally made sense. So and, and if you look at the technology landscape today, where do you guys see the big open spaces? So a, a couple of things. One is that as an entrepreneur, I don't think you should spend too much time focusing on that question. Um, one, in our area, there's so many open spaces. Uh, but two, you're, what's more important is finding that specific idea. Yeah, so there, we could name eight different areas. I mean, you probably have investments in like 30 sub-sectors uh, that all can be perfectly good ideas. Um, we benefit here from a huge fundamental trend of you know, almost everything, e-commerce, advertising, infrastructure, cloud, everything is going up. Um, you know, banking online, you know, 3D printing, everything is gonna grow. And so what's more important is your specific idea. I'm thinking a lot more about the financial services area right now, they haven't launched anything yet, but just feel like you know, banking at every level in the broadest uh, definition will be moving more and more online. You're already seeing a bunch of it. So that's an area I'm thinking about, but I, I think they're all good. But I, I have no area of focus, as you can see from my startups at all. Um, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask. But they've all worked, most of them worked. Yeah, I mean, same thing. There's a general positive trend of uh, technology is helping improve people's lives in general and simplifying or processes that were not working very well before. And it's true in everything. And so you're gonna see it in manufacturing with 3D printing, we're, we're seeing it you know, in the internet of things, robotics, education is on the verge of a revolution with like the things of Udacity and the MOOCs in general. We're, we're gonna see, ultimately we're gonna see mind reading devices where you'll be able to project your thoughts. I mean, there's so much innovation and evolution arriving 
in pre pretty much every sector of the industry, from medicine to self-driven cars, you name it. So there's no one sector that say, oh, this is an area of opportunity. Uh, I mean, to Kevin's point, is like focus on things that you'd like to do and that makes sense to you. Now, I like, uh, the, 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 I guess, I like creating marketplaces and I like uh, finding, creating liquidity in places that didn't have them before, um, which is why I built an auction site and most recently a classified site, I like Craigslist. So my current theme is how do you take the, these marketplaces which frankly, they help, but they have pretty bad experiences for buyers and sellers. They need to do a lot of work. Uh, I mean, if you're selling a Chrysler, you need to take pictures, you need to write descriptions. If you're buying, you need to contact all these people. There's potential for scam. You need to interact, you need to meet, you need to pay, and basically abstract all of that complexity. And so my current theme is something I call end-to-end -end marketplaces, where the marketplace absorbs the friction away from the buyers and sellers and makes lives uh, simpler for, for both sides. And I'm, I'm, I've helped create one in the art space, I've helped create one in the car space, and I'm looking at other verticals, and I'm investing in other verticals. In fact, I'm investing in a company uh, in the real estate space doing that, uh, which is in this audience. Uh, I told them today I was investing in their company. And so that's a theme that's to me is very big. And when you think about it, you have things like Uber, you know, they've taken an old business that was reasonably broken, and, they've, and it is a marketplace, and they've created a much more delightful experience. And so thinking through things that you hate doing in life, and especially problems you face and like solving them is usually a pretty good, uh, pretty good approach. You guys both have the benefit of, of again, a little bit of perspective here. Um, I am so laser focused on AppNexus. Um, one of the things I've done this year is I've stopped paying attention to Twitter. Uh, business, even, even like Ad Exchanger, which is our industry rag, I stopped reading it completely. Um, I turn down anyone who asks me to invest or advise in their startup. Uh, I have no idea what's hot. I couldn't name any companies or spaces. I just have laser focus. I can tell you where there's not white space right now is anywhere near AppNexus. Um, <laughs> like, seriously, I mean, like this is my job is to crush you if you come close. So, <laughs> however, I would appreciate it if you would go out and get funded near AppNexus so that I can figure out through someone else's money if your idea is any good. Every time someone funds something in our space, you know, I get a bunch of phone calls from all of our investors who say, hey, what do you think of this company? And I go, hmm, interesting idea. And if it's a good idea, I don't respond to the email. Um, I'll launch it in six months. And if it's a bad idea, then I'll just say, that's stupid, um, and hope somebody else funds it. So, I mean, this is really, you know, I think what the, the challenge is is that, you know, when you're in my job, and you're running a scaled company with access to capital, I, I'm going to avoid the mistake you mentioned of over-acquiring, um, but there's a lot of, of incredible value in owning an ecosystem. And since I invented the space back in, you know, 10 years ago, I also have an, an incredible perspective of what's coming. So I think that's the people that you will compete with, is if you walk into an established industry, it's often easy from the outside to say, hey, there's white space. Um, but there's the people inside who are greedy like me, who are, who are hopeful for you to think there's white space? Well, it's a lot easier to attack non-smart tech entrepreneurs and tech companies, right? So if you attack like old, in, old industries that have not, d historically not provided a very good service and or that have you know, monopoly type margins, there's a heck of a lot more opportunities. It's a heck of a lot easier to go after, I don't know, the taxi monopoly in, in cities around the world than it is to go after a company like AppNexus or Although you can make the case that if I'm talking about Google on stage, I'm an idiot, and anyone who wants to attack Google on anything is just absolutely crazy. I mean, so. Well, search would be harder, probably. There's always somebody enticing. bigger than you who you probably shouldn't be poking with a stick. Nah, but poking people is fun. I agree. One last quick question, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, what's the future of the New York startup ecosystem? I think the mayor of the New York tech ecosystem should be <laughs> um, Look, I, I could not be more bullish on what's happening in New York. I mean, you know, in, in, you gotta remember, it's only 15, 16 years ago the, being a double click where there were no startups, there were no people, there were no lawyers, there were very few VC firms. There was nothing. Uh, Boston was a much better place. And today it has completely changed. So New York is not as big as Silicon Valley. Although, if you look sector by sector, there are many areas, we were discussing this, that you know, online media completely dominated by New York. San Francisco is not even very relevant there. Um, I think in things relating to e-commerce, fashion, New York is uh, easily the leader. Um, and you're just starting to see then people branch out. I mean, ad tech has really almost always been uh, the leader. Um, so you're seeing area by area. In enterprise software, we're way behind. Mongo is probably the one 
large exception there. Uh, and I think what you're going to see is many people who spin out of successful companies here, like we saw from DoubleClick, guilt people who spin out at some point, almost all of them do e-commerce. People who spin out of Mongo at some point tend to do enterprise software companies. So you're just going to see that uh, across the board from all of our companies and the whole ecosystem. And it's, uh, it's fantastic. So we're going to be in the, right now we're in like the third generation. Silicon Valley is in its seventh. Um, but if your industry is dominated offline in New York, the odds are in the long term that New York will dominate the online area. And that's going to represent a lot of things. We're probably never going to be the alternative energy capital. Um, but look, you know, we, if you had asked any one of us even 10 years ago, who will dominate 3D printing? Will that be New York or San Francisco? I would have thought somehow it would be San Francisco. It's not. It's New York. Just people did it, and it's ecosystems here, and it's happening. So it's, it's great. It could not be better. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason, when, when you pick a place to build your company, you, know, you think through what makes the most sense from an industry perspective. And there were clearly areas where New York makes the most sense. And you know, if you're in fashion, if you're in e-commerce in general, if you're in app tech, if you're in finance, if you're in media, and, to, and frankly, the entire maker movement is based in New York. I mean, Etsy and all the 3D printing companies, it, it doesn't make sense to be anywhere else. But the reality is it's becoming a broader ecosystem. Um, today, uh, in the U.S., about 65 investments, half of those are in New York. I mean, obviously, I'm here, so I see more deals here than anywhere else, but you're starting to see innovation at, frankly, every level of the ecosystem, and you can succeed from, from anywhere. So there are less unicorns, so there are definitely no super unicorns out of New York yet, but it's definitely coming. And frankly, if, if, you're, if you think of, like, where would you rather live, uh, and if you want to have an interesting life in general, I mean, you obviously need to be laser focused on your startup, but New York is a heck of a lot better place and city to live in. It's more interesting. You, you, you see, if you're a little bit of an intellectual curiosity, the quality of life you're going to have is fundamentally different. And if you're a kid, you know, or a guy in your 20s, and you have to choose you know, between being in New York and being in San Fran, I mean, at the end of the day, you just want to get laid, right? It's gonna, <laughs> New York's the place to do that. It's not going to happen in San Fran if you're <laughs> a kid in your 20s. And so we're just more, no, but it, it comes out of that. Like, where would you rather, rather be and live, and where would, you rather, where would you rather hang out? And we have a massive, massive comparative advantage in having a much better social life and, and providing people with much better social life and interesting lives. So, you know, they, like, it's an easy pitch, right? Come to New York and you'll, you, you'll actually get laid and build a great startup. <laughs> so, um, one, one thing that uh, gets in the positioning of New York, though, which everyone forgets, uh, is we only have one $40 billion, 100% internet company in this area, which you, you're not thinking of. Yeah, Bloomberg. Priceline. Oh, Priceline, yeah. Now, people don't think of Priceline uh, being in New York, but of course, if we're talking about Silicon Valley, the difference between the north of Silicon Valley and the, and the south is 50 miles. Priceline's within 50 miles of here, so it, it, I consider in our ecosystem a lot of the employees live here. Uh, it just, they get so little press, they don't even think of them. But uh, the answer is we've already had a $40 billion company created here, bigger than Twitter. It's an interesting question. I think for me, having been here for you know, the 15 years, the boom, the bust, and you know, this renaissance, I think, of New York, um, I completely agree with Kevin's thesis that we're going to see extraordinary startups come out of the great companies we're building. So I think the next generation of companies, you know, AppNexus has a ton of double-click DNA, um, right, media DNA, 24-7 uh, DNA, but also um, Vonage DNA. Vonage is another great New York area company that at times was extraordinarily valuable. Um, there's a lot of these, you know, sort of second and third generation key employees. Um, one thing I love about New York is that well, for me, you know, getting laid is not one of my key focuses. Um, and this, this is my social life. I don't have one at all. Um, but I do think for the team, there's many more employees who come here from Silicon Valley or from other places after college. We see the recruiting improving. Um, we don't have a lot of social stuff at AppNexus. We say, get out of the office. You know, go over to Spin and play ping pong or go watch a free movie at Bryant Park or, you know, head out and go for a jog on the West Side Highway and say hi to Nick. You know, like, there's so much to do in this area. And if you don't want to be in the city, you can go to the suburbs and commute in so easily. We're incredibly commutable. There's all these major advantages as an employer here um, that we can support the community and actually be part of the community in ways you can't on the West Coast. Um, but my personal aspiration, um, one thing that we know about great entrepreneurs is that when they're extremely successful, they buy sports teams. 
And um, so here's my plan, okay? I'm gonna buy either the Knicks or the Yankees, both of whom I hate with a passion. Because what we also know about entrepreneurs is they're terrible at running sports teams. <laughs> so my plan is to buy one of these two teams and trade all of its quality players to anybody, hopefully Boston, right? <laughs> and then use this as a way to, I mean, you couldn't be worse than Dolan. I guess actually I wouldn't buy the Knicks. Let him run it. They're doing great. But you know. He's, he's one step ahead of you. He, I just figured it out. Yeah. He, he is a Celtics fan. All right, well the point is, right, <laughs> I think that in itself will do more damage to the distractions from my team than anything else. So um, that's one of my personal aspirations. Uh, unless you can think of something better to do with all the money I hope to make. Um, but I think that beyond that, I mean, I do think that you know, New York entrepreneurial leaders in politics will be incredibly valuable. And I don't just mean New York politics. I think that you know, having Bloomberg be deeply invested in the New York startup scene has been great for the city. Um, I expect that to continue. I think the university communities, it's great to see Cornell Techne on here. I think Columbia is getting more involved. I'd love to see you know, Princeton be much more involved here. Yale actually has some interesting things happening. I'd love to see Yale be more involved, to your point about Connecticut being part of the broader New York ecosystem. I think there's just so much potential. Um, if you look at Berkeley and Stanford as examples in the Silicon Valley area, if we, as the leaders of the community, um, whether that's venture capitalists or entrepreneurs or post-entrepreneurial you know, leaders like you two, because you guys are like you know, gods now, um, you know, if we continue to invest in New York and continue to make this a priority and give back, not just to the broader community, but in helping start companies and helping fund companies, um, we can do something incredibly special. And so while I am absolutely contributing nothing right now, um, from that perspective, I do hope someday to be in a position to actually do what you two are doing and you know, spread the seeds a bit more than I can now after I destroy the Yankees. Please join me in thanking these guys very much for taking the time with us tonight. <laughs>